Segabits presents Sega Talk, a podcast talking all things with your hosts, George and Barry. Look, it's a giant talking egg. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the master here. So what? Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Sega Talk. Uh, today, I'm joined with Barry. Are you being tickled? A little bit, I don't know. I just, think it's funny, I just think it's funny that we, like, introduce this, like, hey, I'm here with Barry, like, there's going to be somebody else here, like, <laughs> it's always going to be us, guys, so get yeah. used to it. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about Streets of Rage, and, you know, the game came out on August 2nd, 1991, which makes the game 25 years old at the time of the recording. So it's in its 25th anniversary. Congratulations. Congrats. I mean, it was it was uh, overshadowed by Sonic the Hedgehog's anniversary this that. year. You heard of that game? Yeah, yeah. It's a speedy blue porcupine, right? I think so. I've never played. I'm more of a Mario guy, guys. So right, right. I don't know what I'm doing here in Sega Talk, but um. <laughs> so tell us about your history with Streets of Rage and the first time you played the game. Oh boy. Um, well, I when I had a Sega Genesis. I relied very heavily on rentals because, you know, back in the day, you didn't buy that many video games if you were, you know, a kid who <laughs> couldn't really convince your parents to uh, splash out a lot of money. And so growing up, I really just had the Sonic games. I had, I'm trying to think, I had Dick Tracy, Ghostbusters, uh, and one of my favorite beat em ups at the time was uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the Hyperstone Heist. I love that game. It's one of my favorite games still. And so, of course, you know, I was seeking out other beat-em-ups as a kid, and I inevitably rented Streets of Rage. I never owned it as a kid, but I rented it, and I, I have, I don't, I wouldn't say I have distinct memories. I think when you're coming off of a Konami beat-em-up that's, um, I, I believe, released a bit later than Streets of Rage, Streets of Rage kind of felt like a downgrade at the time, which oh, yeah. <laughs> so sounds blasphemous but looking but you know I, at the time I didn't know that Streets of Rage came before it and how important the game was but I I still have the, the distinct memories I have was uh, the character to select screen I thought that was really cool because I was used to Ninja Turtles and they all looked the same and so to have different characters was really neat um, and then my other one was that that special move where the uh, the car drives in yeah, yeah. It just blows everything up because I think any kid playing this game for the first time, probably anyone playing this game for the first time, if you don't look at the controls, you're just pushing buttons and immediately you waste your special move. Exactly. <laughs> That's yeah. actually what happens to me every time I used to play games. Yeah. And so that that was the first time I played the game. And you know, since then I've played it on various compilations. I've played it on uh, isn't there a compilation on the Sega C D? I, I think there so. is with yeah. better sound. Yeah, with better sound. I have that, and that's that's the version I have right now, and that's kind of my go-to version. I think it's pretty cool to play on the Sega CD, and the sounds are obviously improved. How about you? What's your history? I didn't... I actually played 2 before this one, and the reason I played 2 was because... Uh, well, I mean, my parents were kind of uh, strict about violent games because they think they'll make you a violent person. But my uncle was not very strict on the violent games, so when I would go over, he had he bought Streets of Rage 2, he was into video games, which mm -hmm. is kind of weird because I feel like our parents and our generation's like parents or whatever, they didn't play games. Now we're the parents, so it's like, yeah, we play games, so kids are going to play games. But back then, it was kind of uh, more rare. And uh, so he had two, and then uh, I bought the six-pack when it was already out. And because, I mean, it was cheap, you know, your mm -hmm. parents want to buy you something that's cheap. And it had six games, and I think this was one of the games in it. Which I remember, yeah. Or was it... I don't remember. It's been so long. 1991 was 25 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this game is uh, pretty good. Pretty good. I would say it's pretty good. I think <laughs> it's a little... Because I played two first, so this was kind of a downgrade. I, I didn't like the fact that the cop was the power compared mm -hmm. to... Uh, every character having its own power plus the graphics but oh we'll talk about the music later but goddamn the music man that's oh, that's something else yeah it's good and just to clarify the six pack yes it did it had streets of rage super hang on revenge of shinobi columns golden axe and sonic the hedgehog 
that's the best six pack. Abs, you don't need abs. Women don't want abs. Pull out, pull out that cart. That's it, I dude. Think They're I, all over you. I think I found my new cosplay. I'm gonna lift my shirt and just have that printed out on my chest, or maybe I'll get a special uh, temporary tattoo made and just that attach work. it to my stomach. The real six pack that yeah. women want. Um, when this game was being developed, it was actually an answer to uh, Final Fight. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between the two games, obviously. Uh, especially in character designs, they have this like punk aesthetic for the bad guys, which is like I don't know, I don't know where they got this from, but it's like ridiculous over the top. Have you played Final Fight, and uh, what are your thoughts about the game? I have since played it. I didn't play it at the time, but when I started to hear of these comparisons to it, I knew I had to check it out. And I don't. I mean, maybe it's just because I'm a Sega fanboy, but I didn't really like Final Fight. I don't know. It, um, it, it does some stuff that's pretty cool. I felt like uh, a lot of the grappling and stuff was way better in Streets of Rage. Mm -hmm. I th it did have the graphics. I mean, I remember seeing it uh, as a kid in the rental places, and I thought the cover was pretty cool. It was these two, one mustache dude looking at another guy in the face. But I don't know. I it looks like they're about to kiss. Hey. That's the, kind, that's the kind of game I like, a little homoerotic, <laughs> just just enough, you know? I, I do love the cover in the fact that below their chins, one guy's just getting kicked square in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, um, yeah, I don't know, Like, uh, I feel like Final Fight is a good game. I played it in the arcade, too, because uh, a local A&W had it to play. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was alright, it was pretty cool in the arcade, but the graphics were obviously more advanced than the... Sega Genesis, but the Super Nintendo version is pretty disappointing. You can't play two players. I rent, I rented it with friends before because it was in the rental place I used to rent. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, we'll play this two players and beat it because we can't beat it in the arcades. They make it hard on purpose. Right, and I mean, it's worth noting, too, that this game started on the Sega Genesis, Sega Mega Drive. There was no arcade version, and so, um, and that's something I... I didn't know until later because I always remembered Golden Axe. People would say, uh, the arcade version's a lot better. People would talk about, you know, Shinobi, oh, the arcade version's a lot better. And then they'd say, oh, Streets, uh, Streets of Rage, it's awesome. And I was like, well, how's the arcade version? <laughs> you know? There Act isn't one. Actually, <laughs> actually. I'm going to be yeah. that guy. There was actually. Be that guy. There was an arcade version, but the arcade version was the Mega Drive version on the, in the right. arcade. Right, yeah, yeah, of course. It's But it's just playing the same game. No, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so I, I guess you could argue that maybe the Sega CD version is is the closest you could get to an arcade version, just because it's slightly better in audio. But yeah, it, and I guess that that really works tw for the franchise, just because it's the only place you're gonna find it. You can't be like, oh, I'm gonna play it at the arcade. No, you gotta get and Genesis. Do you, do you feel like Sega fans uh, put Streets of Rage in a pedestal more than Super Nintendo fans put Final? fight in the pedestal? Oh, for sure. I, I I definitely believe that. I mean, are people really still talking about Final Fight? I don't I don't think so. Um and you know we're on the on Segabits.com we're actually doing a top one hundred Sega games article, which should be out in the next month. I just finished compiling it. It was about fifty lists. And Streets of Rage and Streets of Rage 2, they are beloved. They're not number one, but they're definitely up there. And when you see some of the games they're beating, I mean, it definitely shows that at least Sega fans love the series still. And I, I'm not hearing Nintendo fans going, you know, oh, I really want another Final Fight on the Switch. That would be great. No, I'm hearing them saying, you know, oh, I really wish ARMS was another Punch-Out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's yeah. where their priorities lie. And it, it, it's interesting, though, if you think about it, because, like, I wonder if we actually do a top 120 Super Nintendo games, if this would even, or even 50, uh, if this would even top the, the 50, top 50, because this was supposed to be a big killer game on the Super Nintendo, and that's why Sega went and said, we need to make a game to compete against it, and yeah, I think they, they, they did it, they did a good job. Um, as for development, the game was actually... Oh uh, my god, we have to do Japanese names, so I'm gonna screw this all up and then people are gonna hate me for it, but <laughs> that's life, okay? That's just how it goes. Um, they got Noriyoshi Ahoba? Ah Ahoba? Noriyoshi right? but, Oba. Because uh, he, he was uh, actually worked on uh, Super Shinobi, that's what it's called in Japan, but in America we know it as The Revenge of Shinobi, which let's be honest, The Revenge of Shinobi sounds so epic. 
that uh, <laughs> Super Shinobi sounds like a Super Nintendo game. Um, he actually was only three years out of college before he worked on uh, before he worked on this game as game director, and it's actually pretty impressive if you think about it. Can you imagine being three years out of college and they're like, "Yeah, we want you to make one of the biggest uh, beat 'em up games of all time. Can you do that?" I'd be like, "I don't know what I'm doing here," but he yeah, he knew what he was doing. And here's a quote I want to read to you from uh, the read-only memory interview from the Sega Mega Drive and Genesis Collective Works book. You want to pimp that book right here, right, real quick? Well, yeah, it actually, they just met their Kickstarter goal, so they're reprinting it. Um, people who Kickstarted it are obviously getting copies. I, I don't know off the top of my head if they're going to appear on the site again. I'm pretty sure they are for sale, because they did after the first Kickstarter. Definitely check it out. We interviewed him before. My name's in the back of the book in the special thanks, and I'm not talking about the Kickstarter special thanks. I'm talking about the legit, like, legit, so. Barry has I'm a special. vested interest. <laughs> um, after the develop, well, this is the quote, let me start it. Uh, after the development of the Super Shinobi was complete, I discussed with Yuzo Koshiro, the composer of the game, some ideas for making a street karate game. We looked at titles such as Double Dragon and Final Fight and use detective shows like Starts Startsy and Hutch and Starsky. the A-Team. Start Starsky. Yeah. <laughs> Start Sky. Uh, I just ruined Star it. Star Sky. I ruined it even more even more. Yeah. Um, for reference, then we proceeded to create the concept for Bare Knuckle, which is the Japanese name. Uh, you think these two shows actually like show up like you see the influence in the game oh for sure yeah i mean I, I i've think never seen these shows i've never seen these shows by the way okay so. well i mean starsky and hutch you know they did do that um kind of comedic remake with uh, ben stiller and owen I wilson that. I yeah that. yeah and so i mean it, i don't really feel the starsky and hutch so much as i feel the a-team vibe just because it's kind of a a mixed team both in genders and uh, uh races of people who come together and they're just like fighting the good fight um so yeah I, I definitely can see that i really feel like it's more inspired by i mean like we mentioned before um final fight and also probably a lot of those like eight late 80s movies things like that like escape from new york or something um but it's interesting that they they mention those because i know on these shows we always talk about film and tv references and it's nice to see them just straight up referencing some yeah and it's also very interesting that like they just said double dragon i mean it's obviously double dragon influenced because i mean that influenced so many beat em up games after and final fight was also influenced by double dragon i mean the comparisons are there True. the whole look of the the street or whatever the the rip jacket the the jeans all that thing that's straight out of double dragon i mean so we could say there's comparisons to the characters in Streets of Rage to Final Fight, but Final Fight also has comparisons to Double Dragon, so it's like a, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the Streets of Rage team was made up of people who had just finished the game ESWAT, City Under Siege, and one of the more notable developers jet that jumped on the team was, here, oh, here you go, giving me the hard names, um. Hiroaki Chino. Hiroki Chino, um, who served as the game designer for the game. Atsushi Semiya Semiya uh, joined as art director. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, the team worked on the game under the working title of D-SWAT, having the D stand for Dragon. And uh, development started July 16th, 1990, and finished up on December 31st of that same year, which means that the game was developed by a team of under 10 developers working for six months to get the game out. And uh, I, I, think the, I think I know the answer to this question. Do you think that having such a small team and little time was a mistake? Or do you feel that too many hands in the creation of games today are making games feel stale? Me? Uh, I think the whole, I mean, I, I think today, I don't think games feel stale for sure, but like you could tell there's things that are over planned. I think mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that was in these kind of games would be kind of frowned upon and I think companies wouldn't take, like, the whole women that are prostitute looking girls with uh, with whips and stuff, yeah. they don't fly in today's culture. <laughs> and uh, I'm surprised that Sega even did this, you know, especially when they always double think their image now. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think it's a mistake in a way, but I also think that having too little time is a mistake because there are times in uh, streets uh, in Streets of Rage where you're playing a level and you're like, wow, this level is not as fleshed out as the past <laughs> levels. Yeah. There's like a level where they randomly don't have a boss, and there's like a level where you're like, the graphics kind of look like they were gonna work on something, then they just stopped. Like the the beach level doesn't have that great graphics. Right. Um, what is your opinion on this? I mean, I I do think that modern games have too many cooks in the kitchen and too much, um, sometimes too much planning and too much thought put into them. Of course, that does lead to some really great games, but other times it feels like there's just there's too much oversight, I guess. Um, I do think that there was a sweet spot for development on the Mega Drive and Genesis. And I think six months is a bit short. Like you mentioned, some of the levels show this. You know, it, it feels like they could have done more. I really think Streets of Rage 2 is what we probably would have gotten had they given a little more time to work on it. Um, but of course, you have to make the first one and learn your lessons in order to make the better sequel. But having said that, I, I think the game's great. I think, like you said, you know, there are some questionable elements, but I think the fact that they really rushed to get the game done and there probably wasn't a lot of people at Sega, you know, going into month four or five saying, could you cut the uh, prostitutes with whips? It was probably like, well, you made it. It's in the game. Put it out there. It, you know um, what's actually funny about that? Yeah. They actually got worse <laughs> with that kind of stuff. Like, as the time went on, like, mm. two had more questionable things. And then the third game was just like, who was doing drugs when they made this game? <laughs> I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Like they had a kangaroo that's enslaved with like a gay dominatrix. It was yeah. just it was just super strange. I don't know what they were thinking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I really they, yeah. Oh, go well, on. I was gonna say I really feel like in Japan at the time in the '90s there was this kind of weird game of uh, of telephone going on. You know that game where it's like you say something and whis whisper something in someone's ear and then they whisper it and it gets kind of diluted and strange. And I feel like when it came to U.S. culture and what like. U.S. inner city street punks, cops looked like. I feel like in the late '80s, like companies like Sega and Nintendo were pulling from TV and movies, and then as it went on, they started to kind of take what they had already made as their um, kind of vision of what this sort of thing looks like, and then they started to bring in sort of their own cultural influences or just guessing, you know, at, at what these sort of things would look like had they been real. If, if it, that makes sense, I just feel like it got stranger and stranger because they were like diluting it or at least adding it. Yeah, yeah, and so I, it makes sense that by Streets of Rage 3, things just got really weird. And I agree with you, and I don't know, I think maybe that's why Japan is so xenophobic. They're like, oh, get, get out of our country. Uh, you guys are weird. <laughs> you guys have kangaroo sex slaves. What is yeah. this? I mean, I, I know it's not Japanese, but like Jackie Chan's Rumble in the Bronx, watch that and then go, like visit New York and then watch that. It's not, I don't know where the hell they thought they were. Oh, dude, the overdubbing on that movie. Oh, so good. So good. Mm, let me give you a kiss. Mm. <laughs> what is that one? It's like, she broke my freaking nose. That guy, yeah. that, that guy's so good. Anyway, oh. we're going to be talking about Jackie Chan uh, all day, so... Um, D SWAT actually had its uh, like it was in development under D SWAT so long that they actually had the intro scrolling text. They had their own personal version for the D SWAT game that was later changed for Bare Knuckle or Streets of Rage. Uh, you want to read the the scrolling text in your TV voice? <clears throat> yes, of course I do. The 21st century has become the age of the criminal cities, such as Tokyo, New York, LA, Hong Kong, and London, are rampant with organized crime. The ICPO, part of the International Judicial Administration, has been held responsible, and as a result, has been denied the right to arrest. Finding themselves in dire straits, the ICPO has assembled a special task force. Their purpose is to wipe out criminals. To avoid public condemnation, they operate in secret and without firearms. This unique group of warriors have transformed their bodies into deadly weapons. Now they strike dread and vengeance into the heart of the criminal world, who refer to them as the Dragon Swat, D-Swat. 
pretty good. That was pretty yeah. good. So like, uh, okay, and then the, you you want to read the actual one they win with in the end, and then we can talk about which one we prefer. This city was once a happy, peaceful place until one day a powerful secret criminal organization took over. This vicious syndicate soon had control of the government and even the police force. The city has become a center of violence and crime where no one is safe. Amid this turmoil, a group of determined young police officers have sworn to clean up the city. Among them are Adam Hunter, Axel Stone, and Blaze Fielding. They are willing to risk anything, even their lives, on the streets of rage. <laughs> Which one do you uh, prefer of these beautiful intros? <laughs> I, I like the second one more. That first one, I'm still trying to figure out what the hell they're talking about. I, I just like the fact that they even had a like, little, like, uh, what do they call it? Like, when you add more info, like, trying to explain to you what the ICPO or whatever it was. Yeah. And it's like, it's too yeah. much, dude. I know. I mean, can you imagine if the, the, the one they went with would be like, it was a happy, fe peaceful place where people got along and they were really nice to each other. You know, like, you know until one day, a 24-hour period within a week. I love the fact that they say, uh, that it says, like, uh, that they, they have been denied the right to arrest people. It's like, so what? There is no law, basically, is what you're telling me, right? Yeah. So like I, I, I do, do crime and then, like, eh, whatever, you can't arrest me. I do really think the ending that ties into the title is a lot better on the Streets of Rage. The other ones, they're like, they call them the Dragon Swat. D-Swat. And they also <laughs> try to, like, I guess, tie it in with um, E-Swat or whatever, the, the game before right. this. And yeah. I don't know, that was a mistake. I mean, does anybody remember that game? I, I think it's a good game, but I definitely think it would, would have been a mistake to continue it as a spin-off. I do wonder though, since it's called Bare Knuckle in Japan, how did they, how did the text go? Do you know? No, I'm assuming maybe they kept the Streets of Rage. I, I got this from the official thing on the thing, but I haven't yeah. read the Japanese one. That's a good I mean, question. I'm, I can't imagine they would say they are willing to risk anything, even their lives, with their bare knuckles. Maybe. <laughs> that kind of sounds cool. Oh, yeah, it does. Uh, and what do you prefer as a title for the game? There, I mean, we had D SWAT, which we already said we don't like because it's like Dick Squad or something. Yeah, it's like, that's what people. That's uh, not what so, I thought of, but I. <laughs> that's the first thing I think about. And hey, if you want to make comments about me being gay, then good. No, no, no. I'm glad. I'm happy. Um, bare knuckle or Streets of Rage? I'm going with Streets of Rage, and it might just be because I grew up with it. But I, I think bare knuckle. I don't know. It sounds cool too. It God does. Damn it. it. I really like Bare Knuckle when I heard that that was the name because it just reminds me of like, oh, these guys are just going to go in there and punch things with their freaking fist and it's just like, I don't know, it just sounds like grimy, I guess. Streets of Rage is kind of like, if you first hear it, you're like, so wait, you're on the rage, on the streets and you're raging or, I don't know, it's just weird. But I guess now that we grew up with it and it became a brand name, we were like, yeah, Streets of Rage, it makes sense. I think it, I, I like them both. I'm just going to say that. Kind of like the Sonic CD soundtrack. I like both Japanese and uh, American versions. Okay, that's that's fair. Um, yeah. So let me get into the whole, I, I guess, when the game was under development. This is actually going to be kind of an interesting bit to talk about. Mm -hmm. The characters were named something else, and they looked differently. So let's talk about Axel first. Axel was known as God Hand when it was first in development, and his wow. design resembled Chuck Norris, uh, aka the America Segata Sanshiro, if you, for uh -huh. Sega fans that are, don't know Chuck Norris. He wore a karate suit, obviously, because Chuck Norris is a karate dude. Mm -hmm. uh, the character's name later changed to Hawk in the game's beta until he became Axel Stone we already know and love. Uh, <laughs> what is your opinion on the whole change? What's your favorite name out of all three? Boy, God Hand sounds... I mean, now that we know the actual video game God Hand, I can't think of anything else, but that's a ridiculous name. No. <laughs> I think I think Axel Stone is fine. Um, he he doesn't resemble Chuck Norris anymore, but doesn't didn't they just steal Jean-Claude Van Damme? His picture? In the thing? Well, I have a picture on the site somewhere, but it, it kind of looks like Chuck Norris. It could look like Jean-Claude Van Damme. Yeah, but I feel it, like they were stealing a lot of actors' likenesses back then. Yeah, they were, yeah. And 
so <laughs> I like the name Hawk. I like that seems like something that like I would call myself in high school. My name is Hawk, guys. Well, wasn't uh, that uh, uh, a Virtua Fighter? Uh, yeah, but it's like I think a little different. I, I, now I'm trying to remember Hawk. I think it's the last name, right? Hmm. Maybe. Maybe that's what I'm thinking. Um. Okay. And then we had Adam Hunter, the, uh, <laughs> who was knowing. That, yeah, I know. <laughs> You're already like I don't want to talk about this one. No, let's move on. Uh, he was known as Blackbird because he's a black character, I guess, uh, yeah. in the game's early development and later Wolf in the beta. And uh, he was designed as a shirtless kickboxer uh, wearing boxing gloves. And I think huh. they used that whole boxing glove thing with his brother in the second one, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what is your, <laughs> what name do you like the best? I'm assuming not Blackbird. No, I think Blackbird's actually really good. It's a great name. Uh, no, it's terrible. Um, <laughs> as for uh, Wolf, I think, now that I'm thinking about it, it was Wolf Hockfield that I was thinking of from Virtua Fighter. Yeah, there you go. That's what I and thought. And so if you take the uh, kind of the beta versions of Adam and uh, Axel, you get Wolf Hockfield. Isn't that amazing? It, that's not, it, what do you think about this whole thing where they wanted to call him like Hawk and Wolf? Eh, that's all right. I mean, it's got a. It's. I mean, Sega has done it before. I think they might have been. I don't. I feel like Adam Hunter is not that memorable of a character or a name. It's funny because they like basically stopped using him as a character altogether. Yeah. It's like he got kidnapped in the second one. What happened in the third one? I, I don't know. He's not there though. He retired. Yeah. He got tired of the streets of rage. Mm -mm. Uh, Blaze Fielding was known as Pink Typhoon because. I don't know. She's a woman. Yeah. Uh, and women like pink, I guess. And had uh, and resembled more Chung Lee from Street Fighter. And uh, obviously, we know which one we're gonna prefer from this game. Uh, what do you <laughs> like? I don't know. Like looking like Chung Lee, I think it would be too much like Final Fight because Final Fight actually ties in with Street uh, Street Fighter. They're like mm -hmm. in the same universe, and they re they use characters in the fighting game that they do in Final Fight. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I'm glad that they changed it. I like her look that she went with. Yeah, I think she has the best name, too. I like Blaze. It's a good name. Yeah. yeah. It's because you like smoke marijuana, that's why. <laughs> Man, Blaze 420. <laughs> yeah, Vape the... Nation. <laughs> there you go. Uh, st <laughs> uh, Streets of Rage was kind of different because, compared to other games because it featured a bad ending. And I don't, did you ever get the bad ending, Barry? I'm just wondering. I have, yeah, yeah. I, I actually got it when I looked it up. I didn't get it. I never got it when the game was out or when I was a kid because I didn't know there, it was in there. It's kind of hidden in a way. Mm -hmm. So let me talk about how we get the, the, the ending. So first, you have to be two players. And there's a part in the end where you got Mr. X asks the players, well, you found your way here. Would you consider becoming my right hand man? <laughs> and then if both players say yes, you just get dropped to round six and you have to go all the way again and do it all over again. If both say no, you just fight Mr. X and get the good ending. But if you one says yes and one says no, he'll say, after working as a team for so long, you part company, now a fight to the death. And then you have to fight each other. And then when the winner emerges, uh, Mr. X will say, you're no ordinary man. Even if you're a woman, he'll say that. Hmm. It would be a waste to kill you. Why don't you join my organization? At this point, if you hit yes, you'll be dropped again to round six. But oh, if you hit no, he'll say, you're an evil man. I would never have expected this from you. Die, traitor. You really want to die, don't you? I'll be happy to oblige. <laughs> and at this point, if you beat him, you get the bad ending, which shows the character you played as on the throne laughing. And then on the top, it says, you became the boss. You are great. <laughs> <laughs> and then your image turns into like a monochrome image, like you've aged. Oh, man. Uh, what, what is your opinion on the bad ending, and which one do you prefer? I think if you ever get a promotion at work, you print out the "You became the boss, you are great" and put it on your door for the day. Should be ta you should be your tattoo on your chest, and then whenever uh, a girl sees it, they'll be like, "Well, he's a boss. He's pretty great." Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I just I love that whole. It's not just one. It's almost like two or three different ways to get there. Yeah. Um, it must really suck, though. I've never had to play. Well, I, I think I did get the bad ending, so I would have played round six at least once, wouldn't I? You don't but have to. You don't have to. You have to, you have to like, uh, 
know how to get to there. I guess mm-hmm. if you made mistakes, you would go back to round six. So, Oops. yeah. They, that that would hurt. Yeah. And I, I liked it. It's kind of, um, I wouldn't say it's deep, but it's kind of interesting the fact that, like, you get corrupted by corruption. Mm-hmm. And then you become the boss, even though it's everything you fought against. I, I, it's pretty interesting take. Uh, it's not obviously like cinematic, like Uncharted these days, but right, I thought right. it's a nice but little it, secret. Yeah, and they did that for quite a few games uh, at Sega. I mean, of course, the Sonic games are most popular for their good endings and bad endings. Um, so it's it's cool to hear another game from that era, from that company doing those sorts of things. It's a fun Easter egg. Uh, you want to talk about the pretty pretty good soundtrack that people say is pretty good it's all right i mean it's not worth talking about but oh, um no you're gonna get people <laughs> mad right now sorry sorry i just wanted to get them raging on the streets with their bare knuckles uh so what set streets of rage over the competition and for a lot of fans including myself i was i was just joking don't beat me up was the amazing soundtrack by legendary composer yuzo kashiro who had prior soundtracks and was already praised for his work on The Revenge of Shinobi. But his work on Streets of Rage made him legendary. And Kushiro didn't just write the music, but he had to program the music to get the most out of the hardware he was given. This was obvious if you listen to his soundtrack compared to less experienced game developers on the Genesis. He called his audio programming language Music Love. And um, one of the reasons uh, it became it's Sega had a hands-off approach when it came to the game development and so this is what Yuzo Kashiro told Red Bull Red Bull Music Academy which is not a school I think what is this like Red Bull energy drink yeah they have uh, their own like little site where they do kind of like documentaries on like older they did this whole thing called digging the carts where mm-hmm. they interview old Japanese composers and how people got influenced by their music now and then they go back, and then they interview them, and then they look at it. So they did a whole episode on him. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah, and so here's what he said. He said, Sega didn't tell me what music they wanted or gave me any kind of direction. I only ever did stuff that I liked myself. I told them club music would definitely take off, and I wanted it to be like that. And I gave them a demo. The manager of the consumer department at Sega back then really liked it. It was lucky. I think there were people there who would have refused music that wasn't really popular in Japan, but the manager really took a shine to it. <laughs> he took a shine to it. I like that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what are your thoughts on the Streets of Rage soundtrack? And uh, have you ever is this the first game you ever heard hit his soundtrack in, or have you heard another game prior to this? Um, I I feel like his Streets of Rage soundtrack was the first one I've heard from him. Uh, just going chronologically, um, the Shinobi music he does is just fantastic. But um, yeah, as far as Streets of Rage, I think Streets of Rage 2 might have been the first. Maybe Streets of Rage. I really? Can't, okay. I can't remember which one I played first. But the one that really sticks with me is uh, Streets of Rage 2, the first track. What is it? Go Straight? Yeah, Go Straight. That's uh, yeah. Yeah, that's burned into every Sega fanboy's oh. mem- memory oh, bank. The- the build up to that, and then just when it kicks off, it's so good. It's and so I, good. I mentioned before, like the uh, the oh, in the notes because I wrote the notes uh, that <laughs> Sega Genesis developers that weren't really experienced with the Sega Genesis really sucked at really using the games, the system's potential. They kind of mm-hmm. just shit music out, and then when people heard it, they're like, Sega Genesis doesn't have good sound, but oh. How wrong nobody, they are. Yeah, nobody could deny this game is amazing at what it does. And it uh, shows you that Sega Genesis hardware is pretty, pretty good when it comes to sound. Um, yeah. A- as far as this, my first soundtrack, I mean, I heard he, there was a game that they brought over a long time ago for the NES called uh, Legacy of the Wizard. And that's the first soundtrack I think I heard from him. I was like a really, really tiny kid. And mm-hmm. my cousin had it. It's not a good game. But the music is worth listening to, so uh, I think it's called Legacy of the Wizard. It's, uh, yeah, uh, it's, eh, the game's whatever. It's one of those games that's, like, really badly designed and wanted to be Zelda. So you get mm-hmm. to pick, like, a family, and then, what, like, you could pick the dog, you could pick the daughter, you could pick the boy. And then you go into this open world and you have to solve these puzzles and then go back and then switch to another family member. 
it's hard for anybody to figure that out because it's like really hmm. poorly designed when you're flipping all these characters. But the game has come and went. It's 25 years old. There's a lot of uh, legacy, I guess you could say, but it's funny that so many people remember Streets of Rage when the last game came out in 1994, which is like three years after the first one. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what's your general opinion about Sega just stopping the Streets of Rage franchise? I think it's I think it's a real shame that they have not done any games since. I understand that Streets of Rage really shines in 2D, and so maybe it was just one of those things where once they started to move into the 3D realm, they felt that it just did not deserve to move forward. Now, I mean, you could argue that there are games out there from Sega that have continued the tradition. There's been, um, what is there, Die Hard Arcade. There's um, Spike Out. Um, or Spike, Spike Out, yeah, 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 which for the longest time I thought was a volleyball game. When I see the title, I was like, oh, Spike Out. Yeah, it was huh. a pretty bad title for a beat 'em up game, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll admit, I thought Spike Out Battle Street was like a hardcore like volleyball. Where thing. you fight in the street, they're like, put the net yeah. up, let's let's play in the street. The car comes, <laughs> takes the net away. Uh. And then of course the Yakuza series, I think, definitely carries on the Streets of Rage um, legacy, just in the fact that you fight in streets and oh, it's so fun. You know? Yeah, and it has, um, a, and they added a lot of other elements to other games. But yeah, its primary thing is beating people up in the streets. Yeah, but I, I really feel like, I mean, I'm torn because I want to see more of them, but I really don't want to see Streets of Rage treated like, um, you know, like one of those goofy indie games where they are intentionally making fun of the '80s. Like I feel like Streets of Rage, as goofy as it was, it took it seriously. And I yeah. feel like now it might become a little joke. Like it'll, it would be like, oh, remember DeLoreans? Oh you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say um, they also well, Sega tried to, I guess, make it come back, or at least Sega of America tried to mm -hmm. bring it back because it was really popular here in the West. They tried to bring it yeah. back, and I think Fighting Force or whatever was one of the games that came out of it, and mm -hmm. it was published by another publisher after Sega dropped it. Have you played Fighting Force? I, I have. I don't remember that much, but I mean, I definitely did not know the connection between Streets of Rage, and so I'll, I'll have to revisit it to really have a firm opinion, but... Um, I, I, I did play when it came out. I bought it because it was one of those games that like win greatest hits really fast, and it had a PlayStation at the time, and mm -hmm. I went to the store, and I was like, 20 bucks, I could afford that, and uh, I had a part-time job as a little kid. <laughs> uh, just doing stupid things around the neighborhood, the people would be like, here's 10 bucks, here's 5 bucks, and then yeah. you accumulate 10, 20 bucks really fast. So every week I would go to this, I would go to the store and try to buy a game and like mm -hmm. hustle for the whole week. 20 bucks, that's all I need. Nice. It, 21, 21 something, I forgot. I, rem I used to remember how much the tax was because uh, PlayStation had a lot of greatest hits. Like, mm -hmm. a lot. So... Fighting Force was one of them, and I remember thinking right away, this is literally Streets of Rage in 3D when I played it. There's a big guy, there's a girl, there's the yeah. white guy with the obvious, like, all the motifs were there. It wasn't a fantastic game. It was cool seeing in 3D, but I think it's aged kind of poorly. And then they made yeah. a sequel that has nothing to do with it. Like, it looked nothing the same. Mm -hmm. The sequel came out on Dreamcast too, right? Uh, yeah, it did. And that's the one I'm most aware of i don't think i own it but i've definitely played it before and yeah and streets of rage the first one has been ported a a, mi a million times i want to say i want to say mm -hmm. a million times it feels like I it's think been a million everywhere. and one uh, i think the best version of it still is i think we harp this a lot the 3d Cla sega classics on the 3ds mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. so i recommend people that have a 3ds to purchase this game play it it's fantastic get a friend um, there's some parts that are a little too slow. Uh, I would say get the, the one and two for sure. If you like those, get the third one because uh, it has some good merits in it. I know people complain that they don't like it compared to two, but there's something there. Do you remember mm -hmm. the, I want to say this for the legacy, but do you remember the comic book they did for this? In the Sonic Con oh, The art was so good. The art was so bad good. But you know how 90s comic book art was, some really questionable stuff. Yeah, yeah, this was in the uh, the British Sonic comic, right? 
I think so, yes. I've seen scans yeah. online of it. I, I was going to use it for our Instagram post, but I'm like, how many people would like this? Probably not that many. I do know that um, uh, Sega Visions would do comics. I don't know if they did a Streets of Rage. They might have, but it was like this weird kid, and he was like, hey, let's jump into the game, bro. And, and oh, like, uh, yeah. Fuck, I forgot his name. It's like he falls asleep, and he gets into the Sega world. It's kind of oh, like no. Little Nemo uh, yeah, inspired. Yeah, yeah. There's that one where he goes into columns and he's like, oh no, it's like a nightmare. And he's like, oh dude, I woke up. You thank God I have my pizza, dude. <laughs> it's like, it's all you need. Yeah, it's all you need, man. Um, so it's like, a, there's a section we do in every podcast where we talk about the games and movies released in 1991. Um, I think it's a fun little segment to finish off the podcast. So the movies that came out in 1991, The Silence of the Lambs, Terminator 2, Beauty and the Beast, is it Cape Fear, right? Yeah, yep. Point, bl- uh, point Break and uh, Boys in the Hood. I'm pretty sure Boys in the Hood is... Uh, you really relate to that one, right, Barry? Oh, for sure. <laughs> I grew up in the hood. <laughs> Where did you grow up in anyway? I'm just wondering. Uh, you don't want to say? Oh, okay. That's the hood. Actually, no, that was, that's, that was considered kind of the bad part of Minneapolis, but it wasn't bad. Uh, so wh- which of these movies did you like? Um, I, I remember, I distinctly remember, I mean, I definitely saw Beauty and the Beast. I mean, of all these movies at my age in 1991, Beauty and the Beast I saw. But I remember my dad saw Terminator 2 and he like loved it. And I saw the ticket stub and it said Judgment Day. And I was like, (laughs) what is this? Like, I didn't know, like, I saw Judge and I thought maybe it was like a courtroom drama or something. (laughs) Um, Yeah. But now, and it's kind of funny, 2017 now, you know... They're re-releasing Terminator 2 in 3D later this year. Beauty and the Beast has a remake. Uh, 2015 had a remake of Point Break. So, Did you know, they? everything's coming back. Yeah, and um, Hannibal, I think, was just recently canceled, right? The Silence of the Lambs, they had, like, a TV version. Yeah, it was supposed to be him before when he was young. Yeah, yeah, with the guy who cried blood in uh, uh, the James Bond movies, the recent ones. But uh, Yeah, um, I was going to say... Um, Beauty and the Beast was a great movie, though, uh, animation-wise. I was, it was pretty stunning. It, uh, a lot of people were kind of impressed with what the, Disney did with that movie. I'm not sure if I'm into this whole, like, remake classic uh, animated movies in real life. Because, like, when I was a kid, I never wanted to see real-life movies. I don't know who they're trying to... I guess they're trying to go for adults. They used to watch these movies. Yeah, I mean, it's weird because the original cartoons were based off of classic stories that are in the public domain and now they're making a movie based off the original cartoon which is based off these classic stories but by and large the the live action movie is just like the cartoon it's like you know you you got more source material than that but um isn't it funny it, it, that disney uses these uh domain uh what open domain franchises to make a bunch of money and then changes the laws so mickey mouse won't go into open domain or whatever it's interesting. I mean, we'll reach that point with Sonic. Just you wait. Oh yeah. And then we'll we'll be defending Sonic. But um, uh, Beauty and the Beast. It was. Uh, <laughs> this is our Beauty and the Beast podcast. It was nominated for Best Picture, which was the first animated film to do that. And since then, they've created a category for animated films. I, I think that's fair because it gives animated films more of a chance to win an award. But uh, it, it's cool that it broke through. It actually lost to The Silence of the Lambs. Um, and <laughs> I, I'm looking on Wikipedia right now, and I know the movie's called Bugsy, which, uh, you know, Warren Beatty. Yeah. But I thought it said Bubsy for a second. And you got excited, like, didn't you? I, I thought Bubsy was nominated for the best picture. And I was like, oh. hey, if if a cartoon Beauty and the Beast animated movie can become uh, best picture, then why not Bubsy? Uh, oh, and uh, Terminator 2, I saw that movie first in my grandma's house. It was being aired on TV, and I was a kid, right? So I'm watching the movie. I, I man, I love that movie. That's a great movie. I I, I don't know, the Galleria, oh, the, the Galleria, movies. the Galleria, <laughs> the part where he's like, "Where is it?" The Galleria. No, uh, <laughs> that was a good movie. I, I, that was a really good movie. Good pacing. It's worth noting. It's worth noting too that Terminator Two and Beauty and the Beast are both Sega Genesis games. 
Hey, there you go, Sega reference. Oh, and uh, Boys in the Hood, the best part of that movie is when he's all, Hey, you want to see a dead body? That's the best part of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so hilarious when I watched it. But uh, uh, do, you, do, you think, do you think any of these movies either echoed what was going on at the time in Streets of Rage? I, it, obviously, they didn't influence it, but do you think... I think definitely Boys in the Hood. Yeah, Boys in the Hood. I think in the 80s, this was coming out right out of the 80s. So mm-hmm. I think in the 80s, New York and all these like neighborhoods. I mean, I know we, we complain about the police being, we have like a police, I guess people say we're in a police state, but mm-hmm. in the 80s, if you see pictures of New York City, it was terrible. It was like graffiti, gangs, it was Wild West stuff. Yeah, and I mean LA, same thing with LA. And exactly. So when you, I feel like if you, if you play Streets of Rage and then you watch Boys in the Hood, you are probably getting a much better depiction of America in Boys of the Hood. <laughs> yes. But it, it's interesting to see that comparison. Um, definitely, I mean, to, to have uh, Adam being the only black guy, I feel like if they were really true to how inner cities were in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, things like that, there would be a much larger uh, uh, African-American cast in Sega games. Though, I feel like it's a Japanese thing to always put one black character. They have to meet the quota. (laughs) But just Um, one. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, they're from over there. They don't really understand life in America. I'm not giving them too much grief over this, but uh, even The Dark Knight, I guess, like the comic book, the iconic comic book, that's an Mm -hmm. actual, in the 80s, that was a depiction of what New York was like in that time. And it's... That's why it's more gritty and de- not uh, family-friendly Batman, and that kind of changed comics too. And it's it's it was pretty bad times. I think I'd rather live now with lower violence than it was back then. I'll be honest with you. Oh yeah, no, and you you look at a lot of movies from those times. I mean, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, uh, they they all play up on the fact that those places were just like dirty, scuzzy, uh, dangerous, you know, and. And now you're like, oh, I can't wait to go to New York and to, uh, you know, it's it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and uh, actually that's one of the things I actually watched the last night. I actually watched the, the sequel to the TMNT, the new movie, uh, Out of the Shadows. One. Oh, that one, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. I kind of liked it. I don't know. Uh, it was all right, but I think it actually kind of missed, it, like, it's a totally different market. Like, if you watch the first one that came out in the 80s or whatever... Mm-hmm. And then you watch this one, it's totally different thing they're trying to... Co- like, there's this one, the other one was like down and gritty and dirty, New York. And then this other one is more like, I guess, for kids, I guess, and more family friendly, fun. I don't know. I mean, it wasn't a terrible movie, but... Eh. I mean, it wasn't yeah. what the first one was like, the independent film. And Right. And I mean... They weren't you know, trying what, to be well, that. Go Ninja. Go Ninja Go. Go Ninja Go. <laughs> yeah. uh, games that came out in 1991... Road Rash, Sega Genesis version, Neverwinter Nights. Uh, I don't know how to say this game. I never really played these games. Lemonines, Le- Lemines, Lemines, Lemmings. Really? Lemmings. Uh, what is it? What does that even mean? Is that a made-up word? It's an animal. It's those. Uh, it's it's these little animals, and I mean, there's a. Um, I, I guess maybe it's a a myth that they follow each other wherever they go, to the point where if the first one accidentally falls off a cliff, the other ones will follow, and all fall off. All right. And I don't know how true that is, but, um, I mean, Lemmings, I love that game. I mean, um, you can go through the rest of the list, but even even if I was a Sonic the Hedgehog kid in 1991, I think I played more Lemmings that year than Sonic the Hedgehog. Well, there you go. I never played the game, so I might have to try them. Uh, Street Fighter 2, I played this one. Um, Sonic the Hedgehog. You probably heard of Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah. Super Mario World came out this year, too. Wow. And uh, F-Zero debuted with the... Uh, so, which one... Like, which... I mean, we already know which games you played the most out of these, right? <laughs> <laughs> Me was probably Street Fighter 2. I really, really, really loved Street Fighter 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things I liked about the Sega Saturn was that it was like arcade perfect. So to me, having fighting games, that's all I needed. I didn't need anything else. Other Sonic the Hedgehog? What? what? That's just icing on the cake to me. Uh, I was pretty obsessed with the uh, 2D fighters back in the, in the 90s. And I think a lot of people were. Street Fighter 2 really kind of took over America. Do you remember that whole hype? Oh, yeah. I mean, I wasn't even into Street Fighter 2 and I felt like I had to own it. 
But what I was gonna say about Lemmings is if you like Choo Choo Rocket, I'd definitely check it out. Big events that happen in gaming, so we could talk about. Super Nintendo came out in North America, and Sega launched the Mega CD in Japan. Well, obviously the Mega CD was better than the Super Nintendo. That's what I'm saying. I don't really know why we're talking. Did anybody even buy the Super Nintendo? I'm going to have to check on the internet. I haven't heard of it. What is it? Soup. 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 Oh, soup. It's a question. Soup or Nintendo? I'd prefer soup any day. Soup is good. It's good for your bones. It's good for you. No. I mean, the Super (laughs) Nintendo was a pretty big thing, and Sega really uh, uh, took it to them, I think coming off the success of the the NES and then coming with the Super Nintendo, a lot of people questioned if Sega could keep up momentum, and I think they answered the question just perfectly. And I think that's Mm -hmm. one of the rare times they did this, because after this, there's a lot of stumbling that happened with the company. And I feel like there was a split, too. I feel like the, the people over at Sega of America felt like they could hold their own with the Genesis against the Super Nintendo. Whereas in Japan they were like, oh, we gotta, we gotta add, do add-ons, and so the Mega CD came out. And I, I, I don't recall what Tom Kalinske told us when we interviewed him, but I feel like he probably wasn't as on board with the Mega CD. It was more. Maybe. It it felt to me like they were trying to uh, fight. Uh, what's that? Turbo Graphics 16. I forgot what it was called in Japan, but mm-hmm. they had a CD add-on. I felt like, and they were basically popular in Japan like while we love the Sega Genesis here the the Sega Mega Drive wasn't really that popular in Japan it was that the most popular console for Sega in Japan was the Sega Saturn so I think they were trying to release this to one up the Nick I think that's what they're called NEC nobody really knows in America the TurboGrafx-16 because it, it wasn't popular here but it was popular in Japan oh for sure and I mean the collecting market for it here now is kind of exploding because when I go to my retro game store, they actually have a shelf for it. It's not a lot of stuff, but they they made room for it and people buy it. So yeah, my friend my my friend bought his mom bought it in a yard sale for like five bucks with like twelve games. So wow. now that's like a thousand dollars worth of retro games. Nice. But uh, yeah, I don't know if the Sega CD was a mistake. I think it was a, a trend that was happening during this time. I think now that we see the big picture, yeah, we'll say it's a, a, a mistake. But, you know, back then it's hard to see what the next big thing is. And you want to be ahead of the curve all the time. Oh, for sure. And I don't fault Sega for that. And to be honest, I feel like the Sega CD is definitely a worthy purchase. There's a lot of great games on it. You just have to really dig. Kind of like the Sega Saturn in the U.S. Yeah. Um, so that's it for this podcast. Yeah. Let us know what you think about Streets of Rage and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes even on YouTube it's on YouTube now you you heard about this technology YouTube technology yeah I I hear that when you post your podcasts on YouTube people uh, leave very friendly comments they don't they don't pick a pick apart what you say or how you say it and uh, uh, they don't get offended yeah no never this George guy's a fucking retard that's what they say (laughs) on there but uh sadly they have said that (laughs) I didn't know how they found out I'm gonna be honest with you (laughs) And now you're now they're going to get angry that you said that, even though that's what someone said. <laughs> <laughs> they did say that to me, but it's fine. I'm okay. So as we do in all of our Sega talks, we end with uh, a tweet out to our listeners and maybe even people who don't listen, but they do follow us on Twitter, asking them what they thought of the game. And so we asked, why do you like or dislike the first Streets of Rage? Let us know. And... We heard from our own Kore Maru, who said he likes the music, gameplay, and art style, and he dislikes fighting Mona and Lisa twice. Uh, a person named at zero the fool five said best OST is best. I can't argue with that. Jumbo Max 792 said this game was a huge part of my childhood. It has extremely awesome music, and the best stage is the elevator stage. We had uh, a minor celebrity, uh, I believe it's pronounced T. Lopes, T. Lopes Music, who's doing the music for Sonic Mania. He specifically called out Streets of Rage 2 as being his favorite game in the world. Uh, There was a follow-up comment from Sonic Stadium's Adam Tuff, who said, I was so disappointed to eventually learn what the characters were actually saying, to which uh, T. replied, 
I imagine my reaction when I found out that Rio wasn't yelling a dolphin. So I guess they're <laughs> having a little conversation there. Um, uh, the soundtrack is great. The combos felt meaty compared to other games, character variety. But Streets of Rage 2 one-upped it in every fashion, and that was from Mugs Mahandra. We also had Draconius, who also said, like Streets of Rage 2 first, and after the first game, uh, he dislikes Streets of Rage 3. A lot of, lot of love for the soundtrack. There are so many comments for the soundtrack. Um, uh, Zio Elysium said he likes the soundtrack. Start of a great series, special attacks, has blaze, dislikes, clunky slash sluggish, and the difficulty. And finally, we have unexpected, un- unexpected, God, some of these names. Uh, <laughs> he loves the level one colors, the combos, and the music. I don't like the movement speed and the color choices of most levels. Well, you know what? Despite that, we love Streets of Rage. Thank you for listening. <laughs>